Praise the Lord. Are you there? I said, Praise the Lord. The Lord bless us tonight in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for our training. Thank you for the investments you are making in our lives. Thank you for the way you open our eyes, touch our hearts, and fire us up. We're praying, oh Lord, I come in here and being trained will not be in vain in Jesus' name. It will affect our growth in the house fellowship. It will affect our growth in the district, affect our growth in the whole church. Help us, Lord, to be fire brands for you and to do what you have called us to do effectively. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody will shout, Amen. Amen. We're coming to Matthew chapter 9. And I read from verse 36. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. And when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and they were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. As Christ called the disciples to himself so that they'll be with him and so that he will train them, he will transform them and they will have the same mind the same heart, the same concern, the same compassion for the lost, like he had compassion for the lost. One, he wanted them to see with their eyes he saw the multitude. Two, he wanted them to seek the lost like he sought the Lord. Three, he wanted them to sacrificially give themselves as he, Christ, the Lord, the Savior, was sacrificially giving himself. For he wanted those disciples to so have the mind of Christ and the mind of the Savior that the essential sin to them will be the essential sin to him. And so as he saw the multitude, there's something he thought. There's something that he felt. There's something that he wanted to do. You see the multitudes in the streets, in your communities, everywhere you go. How do you feel towards the multitude? How do you see the multitude? How passionately do you seek after the salvation of the multitude come back to verse 36 but when he christ saw the multitudes men women young and old he was moved with compassion on them why because they were poor because they were hungry because they had no food because of the economy of the nation at that time because of physical material things no because they fainted and because they were scattered abroad a sheep having no shepherd no one to direct them no one to teach them no one to train them no one to disciple them then said he unto his disciples the harvest truly is plenteous but laborers a few. He used the word harvest. As you look at the Old Testament and the New Testament, you'll find that the word harvest is used in different ways. Number one, it's used for their festing of crops on their field, in their farms. Two, it's used for the bringing of souls into the kingdom of God, harvesting them, getting them away from the field of the world and reaping them and bringing them to the safety and to the cover of the kingdom of God. Three, it is used for the end time harvest. 
end time the sense that when the world is coming to an end as the world comes to an end there'll be judgment and the righteous will go to heaven and the unrighteous the evil will go to the other side the place of punishment let's look at that word harvest in those different ways i'm looking at john chapter 4 and i'm reading from verse 34 john chapter 4 verse 34 jesus says unto them my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work say not ye there are yet four months and then cometh the harvest it says as you look around and you look at farmers raising their crops don't say looking at the time we are now the harvesting time the reaping time is still for months to come it says behold i say unto you lift up your eyes and look on the fields it's still talking about the fields the normal harvesting by the farmer for they are white already to harvest it's crossed over to soul winning it's crossed over to the souls of people that are ready we need to go to them and he that reaper receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal you know now he's coming to the harvest of souls bringing them out of the field and the wilderness of sin and bringing them to life eternal that both he that sows and he that reapers may rejoice together he's talking now about the reward we have at the end of time and herein is a saying true one sows sowing the seed of the word in the hearts of people and another reaper i send you to reap it wasn't sending them to farm to cultivate or to reap the fields was sending them to bring souls into the kingdom so he uses the word harvest as bringing souls into the kingdom i send you to reap that we're on ye bestowed no labor other men labored and ye are entered into their labors number one there is the harvesting of the fields natural normal physical number two there is the reaping of souls seeking to save those who are lost three we use the harvest the lord jesus christ used the word harvest in terms of the final judgment day there's a final end of the world harvest when the righteous are admitted into heaven and those who remain unrepentant until death until the end are cast into hellfire harvest now that's by the believers harvest at the end of time that will be by the angels of God. Let's come to Matthew chapter 13, verse 30. Let both grow together until they harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles. To burn them but gather the wheat into my pan verse 39 the enemy that sowed them the tares is the devil the harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels as therefore the tares are gathered and burnt in the fire so shall it be in the end of this world the son of man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out 
of, the, of his kingdom all things that offend and them that do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire there shall be wailing and gnashing of tears then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father who has ears to hear let them hear what will have ears to hear in jesus name but now we come to the present day harvest which is what the lord is talking about today to us the present day harvest we come to john chapter 4 from verse 34 john chapter 4 verse 34 jesus says unto them my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work say not ye that yet four months and then cometh the harvest behold i say unto you lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they are white already to harvest not the end of time now already at this time at this particular time now they are already white for the harvest we're coming to luke chapter 10 verses 1 and 2 luke chapter 10 verses 1 and 2 after these things the lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come therefore said he unto them the harvest truly is is great at the present time not in the future now is talking about the harvest of souls into the kingdom now he himself had been doing it the 12 had been sent out two by two and they have done it and was still doing it and i was going to have the 70 and he sent them out two by two so that it can be done 12 plus 70 84 of them were already doing it he sent them forth that they will gather souls into the kingdom and yet he said the harvest is great and the laborers are few and so there was another one that john and james saw casting out devils in christ's name but he followeth not us we forbade him jesus said don't forbid him we don't even have enough the 12 the 70 and that other one they're not enough and one said i will follow you let me go and bid them farewell at home we don't have that time you don't have that leisure the harvest is great and we don't have enough if you lay your hands on the plow and you look back you're no more worthy of the kingdom and so go and preach the word of the kingdom verse 2 it says but the laborers are few pray ye therefore the lord of the harvest that he will send false laborers into his harvest and that's why he has called you and the field is white and the laborers are few still few even with all of us involved that's why he's saying we must rise up and do it and bring in other people they too must join us they must do it in jesus name they will and i will will not allow the harvest to pass and the people are not saved jeremiah chapter 8 jeremiah chapter 8 i'm reading from verse 11 jeremiah 8 11 for they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly saying peace peace when there is no peace there are people that are going out 
and they too they appear to be preaching preaching the gospel harvesting but they are not thorough in repentance they are not thorough in confession they are not thorough in faith in christ they are not thorough on conversion and he tell the people you are all right they healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly and they said peace peace when there is no peace look at verse 20 the harvest has passed the summer is ended and we are not saved there are many people that others have told peace peace everything is all right when nothing is all right and the last time if we don't try so to go to them and reach out to them they will cry out the harvest is past the summer is ended and we are not saved people around us will be saved people in our city will be saved people in our country will be saved people in this continent we're going to reach out to them will spare no efforts will reach out to the gospel they'll be saved in jesus name in our passage today the harvest refers to the preaching of the gospel leading sinners to repentance leading sinners to faith in christ leading sinners to forgiveness and salvation leading sinners to freedom with victory over sin the topic today is purposeful and proper concern for the harvest of souls purposeful and proper concern for the harvest of souls a concern must be purposeful must be like Christ's art when he saw the multitude and his intention and his zeal and his passion was to reach them with the saving gospel purposeful proper proper concern the concern that is proper is that we make sure we see them through until they have genuine salvation that's a concern for the harvest of souls three things we're looking at number one concern for sinners without entanglement with their sins concern for sinners without entanglement with their sins point number two commitment to soul winning with the experience of genuine salvation we don't want to go out and just preach what we think is the gospel and make the people respond to what we think they have heard and yet their names are not in the book of life and yet they are not fully and properly saved commitment to soul winning with the experience of genuine salvation point number three companionship of the spirit without christ we can do nothing without the spirit of christ we can do nothing therefore we must have connection with the spirit of god we must have the companionship of the spirit of god companionship of the spirit with endowment for strength endowment for strength we need that endowment of power so that we'll stand straight we'll stand firm we'll stand with a strong backbone we'll stand with great conviction we'll stand with boldness and courage and we will declare the true gospel to the sinners that will bring conviction to them send them on their knees and make them to cry out for real salvation companionship of the spirit with endowment for strength number one do you remember number one tell me i can barely hear what you are saying that's right concern for sinners 
without entanglement with their sins. We're coming back to Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. It says, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. And because they fainted, and they were scattered abroad, a sheep with no shepherd. The shepherd himself, the Savior himself, must remain sinless while he is concerned about the sinful. The Lord himself remained firm while the people he was concerned about were falling. The Lord himself was courageous and strong while the people he was concerned were fainting. He wasn't like them. There's no point for the Savior to be like the sinner. There's no point for the soul winner to be like the sinner. We are concerned for the sinners, but we're not going to get entangled with their sin. Look at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, I read from verse 1. In Galatians chapter 5, reading from verse 1, talks to us about believers. You're reaching out to reach unbelievers. You're reaching out to tell sinners the way of salvation. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. The sins you left before, the evil you left before, the defilement you left before, the filthiness you left before, that's what you're giving testimony to. As we are telling them, come to the Lord. I was like this, I was like this, I was like that. The Lord saved me. It changed my life. And if you are going to be an effective communicator of the gospel, you must be standing on solid ground while you are bringing out those people out of their sins. You are concerned, but you are not going to be like them. You are concerned. You're not going to do what they did. You are concerned. You're not going to get into the error. You are concerned. You will not be entangled with their sins while you are concerned about them. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, I read from verse 4. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 4. No man that worries entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that she may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier, no man that worries entangles himself. As you are going to the sinners, you know, sometimes there are some people that say, if I don't look like them, if I don't dress like them, if I don't drink what they drink, yeah, I don't like drinking, but just for their sake, for them to know I am just like them. If you are like them, you need salvation yourself. It's because you are saved and it's because you are different. That's why you are going to them. You are concerned for those sinners, but you are not entangled with their sin. We're looking at Mark chapter 4. In Mark chapter 4, I read from verse 18. Concern for sinners without entanglement with their sin. Mark chapter 4, verse 18. These are they which are sown among sons, such as hear the word and the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things and training choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Many of those people have churches and denominations, they are preachers. They are traditionalists, they have creed, they have doctrine, but their creed, their tradition is not doing them good. Why? Because of the cares of this life 
and because of the deceitfulness of riches and because of inordinate desire for many other things they are fruitful that's why you are going to them and as you go to them you are concerned they're so religious they're so zealous they do quite a lot yet they're not saved you don't want them to begin to introduce you to their own business and their own uh, kind of uh, cares of this life you don't want them to sway you and to suck you into politics you are concerned for them to bring them out you don't want them to bring you in to what has not profited them yes go out and preach the gospel to every creature but be careful where you go don't get entangled don't get sucked up and don't get pulled down to their evil it tells us in second peter chapter 2 we're reading from verse 20 second peter chapter 2 reading from verse 20 for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the lord and savior jesus christ that's a believer he has escaped the pollutions of the world that's a soul winner he has escaped the pollutions of the world that's the preacher he has escaped the pollutions of the world that's why he's going out to those people in the world and he's calling them repent and believe the gospel but if after those preachers have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ those preachers are again entangled therein by communication with sinners by interaction with the sinners by reaching out to those sinners by becoming familiar with them if they again entangled therein and overcome the latter end is worse with them than the beginning you will not be like that your end will not be worse than the beginning my end will be better i said my end will be better what i fought years gone by i must fight now what I overcame years gone by, I must overcome now. What I said no to in years gone by, I must still say no. I must not become entangled. I'm interested in winning the sinners. I'm interested in bringing them out of sin. I'm interested in having the church grow. I'm interested in having multitudes, millions of people coming to the kingdom. But in that interest in that passion in that zeal i must not compromise i must not lower the standard i must not get entangled with the sins of the people i am trying to win i say that for myself i say that for you galatians chapter 2 in galatians chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 18 Galatians chapter 2 verse 18 For if I build again the things which I destroyed I make myself a transgressor What does that mean? Paul the apostle was saying I have concern for the children of Israel I have concern for those who are Jews And I am a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin and I want them so much to come out of evil, out of their sin, and come to Christ. But as I go around, I've been telling the people, I say it with word of mouth, I put it in writing, the old covenant is gone. I say it in writing, I say to the people, the tradition of the Jews cannot save. I tell them point blank that you are seeking salvation through the law and it doesn't work. You can't get saved that way. I tell them that the law, Moses, civil law, religious law, tradition of the elders cannot save. Only Jesus can save. And I prove to them by the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ and is the only Savior now. 
if I become so concerned for the salvation of the Jews that I say, all right, I've seen them. I've spent so many years trying to reach the Jews. They will not listen if I keep on saying what I'm saying. But I know if I come through the gate of their law, if I come through the door of the abolished covenant, and I said, all right, I know what you want to hear. The Old Testament ceremonial law, everything is all right. Circumcision, everything is all right. And uh, all these things and the rituals, everything is all right. And, uh, but add Christ. Keep them, hold them, but add Christ. They will agree. And then many of them will come to my side. But then I'll get entangled. Because if I build again, the things which I once destroyed, I make myself in trying to win them, those Israelites, I'll make myself a transgressor. The same thing with us. All that the Lord has taught us through the scriptures, that this is sin, polygamy, this is sin, drunkenness, this is sin, stealing, this is sin, corruption, and it must come out of them. But if we say, now think about it. How many of these people do you know are not already divorced and remarried? How many of these people do you know don't practice corruption? How many of these people do you know do not use some magical occultic things? So, if we keep on emphasizing those things, how many of them do you think will come? If because of that, because we are concerned for them, we tone down on the truth and we suspend the truth and will not tell about repentance in the New Testament way that is thought of. And then we build up again and we permit and we allow the things were once destroyed. They will not be saved. We're only telling them peace, peace when there's no peace. And they will see cry, the harvest has passed and the summer is ended and we're not saved. Not only that, we ourselves getting entangled will be lost. I pray you'll not be lost. Look at a man came out of the well, standing on top of the well. He throws a rope down, wanting to pull out the man in the well, pull him up. But it's the man in the well that has succeeded in pulling him down back into the well. God forbid. They will not pull you down. They will not drag you down. They will not bring you back to the pit and the well of sin in Jesus' name. Look at somebody. He's trying to get his soul out of the hand of Satan. And he's getting that soul out of Satan, out of evil, out of the hand of the taskmaster. And while he's doing that, talking to him, pleading with him, and praying, and wooing him, the other man too, while you are trying to win him for the Savior as a disciple, the other man too, or the woman, is also talking and talking and using a worldly wisdom. And he wants you eventually to become a disciple of Satan. God forbid. It will not happen to me. I said it will not happen to you. Look at that. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Verse 19, for I throw the law. I'm dead to the law. And he's saying if I come alive again to the law, then I make myself a transgressor. I'm dead to the law. I'm dead to the world. 
I'm dead to sin, I'm dead to evil, that I might live unto God. You will live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What the Lord is telling us is, as you go out, and you are reaching out to sinners, wanting them to be converted, wanting them to be born again, wanting their lives to turn around and be transformed and add them to the kingdom of God. You don't want them to add you to the kingdom of darkness. It will not be. I said it will not be. Judges chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 22. Judges chapter 8. And I read from verse 22. In verse 22, Then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, but thou and thy son, and thy son's son also. For thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Is that good or bad? I said, is that good or bad? I'll read it again, verse 23. Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you. Neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Good or bad? That's good. But look at this now. And Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you that he would give me every man the earrings of his prey. The earrings of his prey. For they had golden earrings because they were, tell me, because they were Ishmaelites. He is an Israelite. He's going to wage war against the Ishmaelites. And he overcame and he conquered them by the power of God. And he seemed to like what was on them. He said, I will not rule over you. As for that, leave that aside. But I like this one. Give me this. And they answered, verse 25, we will willingly give them. And they spread the garment and did cast therein every man the earrings of his prey and the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was a thousand and seven hundred shekels of gold besides ornaments and the colors and purple image that was on the kings of Midian and beside the chains that were about their camel's necks. And Gideon made an effort thereof and put it in a city, even in Ophrah. And all Israel went thither a warring after it, which sin became a snare unto Gideon and to his house. He became entangled, entangled. The Lord sent him forth. He went in the power of the Spirit of God and overcame them. Coming back, he became entangled. I will not be entangled. Second Chronicles chapter 25 verses 1 and 2. Amaziah was 25 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jeho Adam of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not 
with a perfect heart, saved, not sanctified. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Outwardly, everything appeared all right, but not with a circumcised heart, sanctified heart, perfect heart, a pure heart. Look at verse 14. He went to the battlefield. He overcame and conquered. After conquering, see what happened. Verse 14. Now it came to pass after that Amaziah was come from the slaughter of the Edomites that he brought the gods of the children of Seir and set them up to be his gods. He said strange gods to be his gods. He said idol gods to be his god. And he bowed himself before them. And he burnt incense unto them. Wherefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Amaziah. And he sent unto him a prophet. Which said unto him, Why? As thou sought after the gods of the people, which could not deliver their own people out of thine hands. You depended upon the God of heaven. You relied upon the God of heaven and he gave you victory. Why is it now you are depending upon their gods who could not deliver them? And it came to pass in verse 16, as he talked with him, that the king Amaziah said unto him, Are thou maid of the king's counsel? Did I call you and say I need counseling? Did I tell you I want correction? Did I tell you I don't know what I'm doing? Did I tell you get a message from God for me? Don't you know I'm adult enough to know about what I'm doing? Forbear. Why should thou be smitten? If you continue, I'll show you I'm the king. I can worship whatever I want to worship. I don't want to be any other under control of any prophet. Then the prophet forbear and said, I know that God has determined to destroy thee. Because thou hast done this, he became entangled and has not hearkened to my counsel. God help us, we will not be entangled. All right, I will not be entangled. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 14. In verse 14, Acts chapter 8. Now, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received, the word of God. They sent unto them Peter and John. Come to verse 18. And when Simon the sorcerer saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Peter and John came from Jerusalem, saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost and they laid hands on those Samaritans and they received the Holy Ghost and now Simon the sorcerer came to them Simon the backslider came to them Simon the secret sinner came to them and said I want to give you money sell this power unto me he wanted to lead them to take in bribe Jesus had said, freely you have received, freely give. He wanted to now bribe them. He wanted to corrupt them. And he said, I offer you money, saying, give unto me. Verse 19, give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter, he will not be entangled. I will not be entangled. You will not be entangled. We shall not be entangled in Jesus' name. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast taught that the gift of God may be purchased with money. 
thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter for thy heart is not right in the presence in the sight of God if your heart is right and you are going to the people whose hearts are not right in the presence of God you don't want to be entangled with them in their bribery, in their corruption, in their worldliness, in their filthiness, in their lying, in their evil. He said, you have neither part nor lot in this matter. For thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray, pray God, if peradventure perhaps the thoughts of thine heart may be forgiven thee for i perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity you will not perish with them acts chapter 24 i read from verse 24 acts chapter 24 verse 24 and after certain days when felix came with his wife drusilla which was a jewess he sent for paul and had him concerning the faith in christ and as he reasoned of righteousness notice what paul preached righteousness and temperance self-control self-denial and judgment the judgment to come end of time judgment felix trembled and answered go thy way this time when i have a convenient season i will call for thee look at this he hoped also that money should have been given him of paul paul the preacher paul the apostle paul the one emphasizing righteousness holiness godliness temperance judgment to come he was thinking yes you are preach let's leave preaching aside what we know in our part of the world is that when you're in a case like this you give money your bribe so that i can release you he wanted to corrupt paul nobody will corrupt you you will not be entangled it's so very easy as I want to win them, they too, they want to win you. As I want to bring them from darkness to light, they want to bring you from light to darkness. It will not happen to you. He hoped also, verse 26, that money should have been given him or Paul, that he might lose him. Wherefore, he sent for him the oftener. He was now frequently sent him for paul not to hear the gospel he said enough he only wanted to entangle paul and he communed with him but paul will not compromise i will not compromise you will not compromise we shall not compromise in jesus name we're still concerned concerned for sinners but will not be entangled with their sins point number two now commitment to soul winning with the experience of genuine salvation as we go out to evangelize one thing we must make sure of we're not just into religion or tradition we want the souls to be really saved look chapter 13 verse 23 luke chapter 13 verse 23 then said one unto him lord are there few that be saved and he said unto them strive to enter in at the straight gate for many i say unto you will seek to enter in I shall not be able one that asked him are there few that will be saved he said forget about the number think about yourself you strive to enter in 
make sure you have been convicted of your sin. Make sure you hate your sin. Make sure you turn away from your sin. Make sure you confess from a broken heart. And make sure that you believe on the Savior and you are really saved. For many, I tell you, will try to enter in. They will not be able. John chapter 3, verse 3. John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I'm sure you've seen in the papers. If you have not looked at the papers, I'm sure you've, you know, you've thought about it once or twice or sometimes in your life. You know the date of your birth. And when people die and they write their, the information in the papers, they mention the date of birth and the date of death. The same thing in the spiritual. You must know the day you were born again. The message you heard when you were born again. How it struck your heart when you were born again. How you turned from sin with sorrow for your sin when you were born again. How you called upon the Lord and you asked him to save you. You must know, you must remember. And you must know the change and the transformation that came upon your life. There must be a definite experience of genuine salvation. Look at that again. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man, anyone, except a man be born again. You've been born before. You must not be born again spiritually. Born anew. Born spiritually. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. If we go out then, and we're preaching the gospel, and we just whitewash them. And they don't have a genuine experience of turning away from their sin. And they are not really, truly, genuinely born again from above. We're wasting our lives. We're wasting our skills. We're wasting our efforts. Because except those people have genuine experience of salvation and they can point at it and they can say this is it I got the real thing and there is a real transformation in their lives except that has taken place went to religion worthless religion verse 5 Jesus answered verily verily I say unto thee Except a man be born of water, is cleansed, his dirty conscience is cleansed by the word, his dirty heart is cleansed by the word, his filthy life is cleansed by the water of the word, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God was the use laboring, sweating, running, climbing, descending, and um, you know, here and there. And the people are not born through the cleansing of the water of the world, and they are not born by the Spirit. They must have a genuine experience of salvation if we are really committed to soul winning. Soul winning is the act of winning souls to Christ. Number one, it's convincing them, convicting them, converting them, calling them to repentance. There must be conviction. And then they are called to repentance. Luke chapter 5 verse 32. 
Luke chapter 5 verse 32 I came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance that must take place they must be convinced and convicted of their sins and they must be willing to come out knowing the danger of remaining in sin number two it's separating sinners from the sinful society if you preach if you say you love them and you're bringing them out of their sin genuine salvation means you are separating them the sinners from the sinful society second corinthians chapter 6 verse 17 wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate says the lord and touch not the unclean thing and i will receive you and will be a father unto you and ye shall be my sons and my daughters says the lord almighty the salvation they come out and you must help them to see they must be separated from their sin partners and from sinful society number three you are bringing them out of an evil generation bringing them out of an evil generation acts chapter 2 verse 40 acts chapter 2 verse 40 and with many other words did he testify and exalt saying save yourselves from this untoward corrupt evil devilish generation they must come out they must be removed and separated from that sinful society number four it means that you're removing them from their old sins old habits old tradition if you say you are laboring on them and they remain in the old sins old tradition old habit old lifestyle they're not saved to be saved means that they come out of their old sins second peter chapter one second peter chapter one verse nine in verse nine it says but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins purged from his old sins there must be that purging there must be that cleansing there must be that total separation from the old life the old sins that's conversion if you are converted yourself that is what should have happened and if those people were preaching to if those people we are encouraging to come to christ when they truly come to christ old lifestyle will go winning souls is cutting them off from their former corruption and former traditions former corruptions and former traditions ephesians chapter 2 verse 19 now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and the household of god that means they came out of where they were and what they were doing no more foreigners to the kingdom of god now chapter 4 ephesians chapter 4 verse 22 that she puts up concerning 
the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts conversion means the former lifestyle and the former conversation is off is taken away that will say we are bringing them into the kingdom means we're preventing them from continuing in the pollutions of the world pollutions of the world if we say we're laboring if we say we're evangelizing and they still continue in the pollutions of the world it's a waste of time it's a waste of life it's a waste of our skill they must come out and be prevented from continuing in the pollutions of the world second peter chapter 2 verse 20 second peter chapter 2 verse 20 for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world they must escape the pollutions of the world if they say they are saved or if we say we have led them to genuine experience of salvation for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ they are again entangled therein and overcome the latter end is worse with them than the beginning for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known each to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them but it has happened unto them according to the true proverb the dog is turned to his own vomit again and the soul the swine the pig that was washed into her wallowing in the mire i pray our converts will not be like this in jesus name when his souls mean we're snatching them from the grip of satan from the iron hand of satan second timothy chapter 2 reading from verse 26 second timothy chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 26 and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will those who have been captives and slaves of satan they have been into occultism they have been into idol worship they have been into covenant with the spirit world if we say now that they are born again they are no more attending those meetings they are no more wearing the regalia and they are no more doing anything like sacrifice to those idols they recover themselves from the snare of the devil even though they were taken captive before this is what conversion means we're looking at jude verse 23 it means pulling them out of the fire they're almost getting to hell almost entering into hell fire and if you say you have any use to them and you are helping them to get saved you're pulling them out of the fire jude verse 23 only one chapter in jude verse 23 others save with fear pulling them out of the fire pulling them out of the fire and hating even the garments potted by the flesh hating the garments defiled by the flesh hating the garments soiled by the flesh each sinner must confess and forsake all known sins it's not enough to just say raise up your hand it's not enough to just say believer they must recognize what sin is they must recognize the judgment the condemnation that comes upon sin 
and with that conviction they confess and they forsake all known sins they believe in christ as savior and lord and the holy ghost will give them peace in their heart and give them assurance with a change of life and i'll be love for god and love for the word of god except that takes place total conversion genuine experience of salvation has not taken place i pray uh disciples disciples of the lord that will win from the world will have this genuine experience in jesus name good good amen from there point number three now companionship of the spirit with endowment for strength the companionship of the spirit with endowment for strength look chapter 24 i'm reading from verse 49 in luke chapter 24 verse 49 here the lord himself said and behold i send the promise of my father upon you but tarry ye in the city of jerusalem until ye be endowed with power from on high why because they were to go out to preach the gospel go out and preach the message of salvation look at verse 47 and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at jerusalem and ye are witnesses of these things and behold i send the promise of my father upon you but tarry in the city of jerusalem until ye be endured with power from on high we must have the companionship of the spirit john chapter 14 i'm reading from verse 15 john chapter 14 reading from verse 15 it says in verse 15 if he love me keep my commandments if he love me keep my commandments and i will pray the father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever companionship of the spirit and there's no time we should just preach and just walk and just evangelize without the presence of the spirit of god even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not neither knoweth him but she know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you he dwelleth with you and wants to dwell with us forever and he would abide in us and he wants to abide in us forever so he can supply the strength supply the wisdom supply the power and supply the skill and supply the courage to reach the sinners in the world abide with us forever john chapter 16 i read from verse 7 john 16 verse 7 nevertheless i tell you the truth it is expedient for you that i go away for if i go not away the comforter will not come unto you but if i depart i will send him unto you i pray you have his companionship you have his power you have his strength in jesus name and when he is calm it will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me of righteousness because i go to my father and you see me no more of judgment because 
the prince of this world is judged Acts chapter 4 I read from verse 31 Acts chapter 4 verse 31 and when they had prayed the place was shaking when they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they speak the word of God with tell me tell me out aloud with boldness he gave them the strength strength in their heart courage in their mind boldness in their preaching and sending forth the word verse 33 and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all if we have the companionship of the spirit how does that demonstrate itself one we're controlled by the spirit we're controlled by the spirit not by the flesh not by past habits not by fleshly desire one we're controlled by the spirit Romans chapter 8 reading from verse 14 Romans chapter 8 verse 14 for as many as are led by the spirit of God they are the sons of God you remember that those believers in the New Testament they were led to the people the preacher join this chariot go this way speak to him I have many people in this place come out of the prison arise stand and declare to them all this word of life controlled by the Spirit commanded by the Spirit the Lord commands us through the Spirit Acts chapter 1 reading from verse 2 Acts chapter 1 verse 2 until the day he was taken up after that he threw the Holy Ghost at giving commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen by the Holy Ghost he gave them commandments commandment commanded by the Spirit convicted by the Spirit convicted in the heart convicted in the conscience by the Spirit you see a real child of God is sensitive to the touch the tender touch of the Spirit look at 1 Samuel chapter 24 1 Samuel chapter 24 I'm reading from verses 4 and 5 and the men of David said unto him behold the day which the Lord said unto thee behold I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand that thou mayest do to him as it seem good unto thee then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privately and it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt when somebody has the presence of the Holy Spirit the conscience is tender if he does anything wrong his heart will smite him convict him he will be convicted by the Spirit second samuel chapter 24 second samuel chapter 24 verse 10 second samuel chapter 24 verse 10 
and David's heart smote him after he had numbered the people. And David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly in that I have done. Now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. When we have the Spirit of God, it does not allow us to just fall into this pit and get into this pothole and get into that action and get just beating about the bush. When we do something wrong, no matter how small, the Spirit will convict us, convicted by the Spirit. Number one, controlled by the Spirit. Number two, commanded by the Spirit. Number three, convicted by the Spirit. Number four, compelled by the Spirit. Compelled by the Spirit. Somebody says, I'm saved. Does the Spirit ever compel you to go out and talk to sinners? Do you feel the compulsion within that you should not just sit like that? Do something about the stage of sinners. Acts chapter 10, compelled by the Spirit. Acts chapter 10, reading from verse 14. In verse 14, here's what it says. But Peter said, not so. Lord, for I have never eaten any sin that is common unclean. I have never eaten any sin that is common and unclean. I cannot go to the Gentiles. That's not my lifestyle. I've never done that. I will never do that. And then the Lord kept on showing that trance three times. Look at verse 19. While Peter thought on the vision, the Lord said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. The Spirit said unto him, Doubt nothing. I have sent them. Chapter 11 of Acts. And I'm reading from verse 12. Acts 11, verse 12. And the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. He was compelled by the Spirit. Number five caught away by the Spirit. Caught away by the Spirit. In Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 verse 26. Acts chapter 8 verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip saying, Arise and go toward the south of the way that goes down to Jerusalem and to Gaza, which is the desert. Verse 29, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near, and join thyself to this chariot. That was how he prayed to the eunuch of Ethiopia. Verse 39, When and when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Went on his way rejoicing. I pray the Spirit will not be absent in our lives. The Spirit will not be absent in your life in Jesus' name. Now, number six, constrained and cautioned by the Spirit. We've seen 
the control of the Spirit, the command of the Spirit, the conviction of the Spirit, the compulsion by the Spirit, the catching away by the Spirit, now the caution, the constraint. Acts chapter 16. I read from verse 6. Acts chapter 16, verse 6. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, constrained, cautioned by the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia after they were come to Mysia. They are said they tried, they endeavored to go to Bithynia, and the Spirit suffered them not. They knew when the Spirit constrained them, and He didn't say, No, I'm going to do it. We must still go. They were constrained and cautioned. But then, number seven, called and commissioned by the Spirit called and commissioned by the Spirit. Acts chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 2. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. We learned something of the New Testament believers. They had the companionship of the Holy Spirit, controlled by the Spirit, no exception, no exception, all of them, as many as are led by the Spirit of God. They are the children of God, controlled by the Spirit, no exception, commanded through the Spirit, no exclusion. Nobody was excluded, the men and the women. And that's why they went to the upper room. That's why they were praying that the Holy Ghost will come upon them. Everyone that named the name of Christ, disciples, no exclusion, commanded by the Spirit, convicted by the Spirit, no exemption. If somebody has the Spirit of God living with him, if he really has the presence of the Spirit of God, no exception, he, no exemption, he will be convicted when he does something wrong. He will not just be going through life without any check, without any correction, without any conviction. Compelled by the Spirit, no excuses. Peter could not make any excuse anymore. I said, no, Lord. I've never done that. I can never do that. I will never, I will not do that. And the Spirit said, the men are looking for you. I sent them. Don't doubt anything. Go with them. And then he went with them. When he came back and he explained to the other apostles, he said, what could I do? What could I do? I was compelled. And I couldn't give any excuse. Compelled by the Spirit, no excuses. Caught away by the Spirit, new experience. It had never happened to even the apostles before. But now, here is, uh, here is Philip. He was in Samaria. And the apostles didn't send him. Nobody sent him. But the angel of the left said, go to the uh, way of uh, Giza. And then you'll see the person here saw him. And the Spirit said, join yourself to this chariot. And then after he had done the work and he baptized him in water, he was genuinely converted. He was uh, caught away by by the Spirit, a new experience, constrained, cautioned by the Spirit, no exasperation. That means no frustration. And they were not wondering, but why? We must do it. But why? We're going to do it. But why? We've made up our mind. But why? We have we're put this in place and put that in place. When they were constrained and cautioned by the Spirit, no frustration, no big deal. That's what the Spirit has said. If we don't do it today, he may tell us to do it another time. Constrained and cautioned by the Spirit. Then called and commissioned 
by the Spirit for new exploits. New exploits. Your own time has come. I said our time has come. As the Lord has called us, as the Lord has commissioned us, uh, commissioning us and is saying go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature without any restraint, without any frustration and without any argument, we're going to go, you will go, you will do the work of God in Jesus' name. The work will prosper in your hand. The Spirit of God will be with you. The Spirit of God will abide with you. You'll have the constant companionship of the Spirit of the Lord for endearment, for strength in Jesus' name. And he said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature. Is the Lord speaking to you today? I said, Is the Lord speaking to you today? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. If the Lord has spoken to you, you speak to God now. He said, wait in Jerusalem and be endued with power and pray unto the Lord. And the Spirit of God will come upon every one of us afresh. And we will do the work, we will not fail. We will do the work, we will not retire. We will do the work, we will not run back home. We will do the work and this work will prosper in your hand, in my hand, in our hands together in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and really talk to the Lord, really talk to the Lord. The Lord has shown us a lot today. He wants us to have concern. He wants us to have concern. Concern for the sinners without entanglement with their sin. You're going out, you're reaching unto them. You're going out and you're talking to them. You're going out and you are telling them come to the Lord come to the Lord come out of sin come out of darkness and you are not going to be entangled with their worldliness you'll not be entangled with their sin you'll not be entangled with their occultism you'll not be entangled with any sin that is not of God open your mouth and talk to the Lord that the Lord will help you you'll stand as a soul winner you'll stand as a saint of God you'll stand as a child of God declaring the word unto the people without bringing their idols back home without bringing their worldliness back home without bringing their occultism back home and without bringing anything unclean back home open your mouth and talk to the lord open your mouth and talk to the lord and say lord i'm going to have the compassion you have i'm going to have the concern you have i'm going to have the compulsion of the mind of the heart you have reaching out to sinners Tell the Lord, tell the Lord, tell the Lord, you are going to do it. You are going to do it. You are going to do it. You will serve the Lord, having concern, having compassion, and yet you are not going to be entangled with their sin. You are committed to soul winning, committed to soul winning. And you're going to make sure that the people get into the real experience, genuine experience of salvation. Not just whitewash them and not just say peace, peace, where there's no peace. You are bringing them out of the evil generation. You are separating them from the sinful society. You are cutting them off from their old lifestyle of sinning. Tell the Lord. You do the real work. Tell them sin is hateful in the sight of the Lord. Pull them out. Bring them out. Snatch them from the hand, the grip of Satan. Let them go to the blood of the lamp and wash. Wash and be clean. Make sure you have the presence of the Spirit with you. The strength of the Spirit with you. You can't do this in the energy of the flesh. You must have the companionship of the Spirit. The control of the Spirit. You must feel 
the command of the Spirit. There must be conviction in your heart. That's what shows the ready presence of the Spirit in your life. And you feel compelled. Not that if I like, if I, I do, if I don't like, I'll not do. I'll go if I feel like. I want to go if I don't feel like. You are compelled by the Spirit. Conquered by the Spirit. Called, commissioned by the Spirit. And you respond promptly to the calling of the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name we pray. New power, God has answered. New passion, God has answered. New purity, God has answered. New pursuit, new drive, God has answered. Raise that hand up. Father, in Jesus' name. Every one of us, we come to ask for help. Greater help than we ever thought we will have. Greater power than we ever thought we could have. Greater passion that we ever thought we could have. And Lord, as we come to every brother, every sister, every minister, every preacher, every leader, Lord, supply them everything they have asked for in Jesus' name. Purity, give to everyone. Power, give to everyone. Passion and zeal, give to everyone. Supportive men and women give to everyone Amen. and healing for the whole man, Amen. healing for the whole woman, Amen. every part, internal, external, up, down. Give them total healing, complete healing, perfect healing in Jesus' name. Long life. Lord, look at all your people, add value to their lives, add years to their lives. The devil will not determine how short they live, how long they live. Enemies will not determine how long they live, how short they live. God, the God of heaven, the mighty God, the God of all possibilities, Add virtue, value, strength, years to every life. Confirm it, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name.